All right. Well, I see all board members are here. Um, and I know the, the reporter is here and it is 830 in the morning. So we are prompt here at the Green Mountain Care Board. So I want to welcome everybody. Say good morning. And my name is Jessica Holmes. I'm currently serving as the interim chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Our first item on uh, our agenda today is the executive director's report. So I will turn it over to Susan Barrett. Thank you, Madam Chair. This morning, I want to share with folks uh, in the meeting and in the public about ways you can save money on your health insurance premium. So what you need to know is if you buy your plans in for, uh, as an individual or a family through Vermont Health Connect, that you are eligible for expanded and uh, the federal government recently passed the Inflation Reduction Act, and they've extended the subsidies, which come in a form of a tax credit, for those folks who are buying their insurance, again, individuals and families through Vermont Health Connect. So, for example, if you're making up to $105,000 a year and you're a single person, you are eligible for subsidies this year, right now, even if you've tried before and you were uh, not eligible for subsidies previously, we're encouraging folks to try again because again, the federal government has expanded these subsidies. Next year, that same single person, the income uh, threshold goes up to $118,000. And for a family this year, uh, 2022, the income threshold is $297,000. And then next year it goes up to $333,000 for a family. Um, so far this year, nearly 23,000 people have taken advantage of the subsidies. And for another example, a single person making $60,000 a year could save $324 a month, or a family making $100,000 a year could save almost $1,400 a month. A very important point, if you're buying your insurance through Blue Cross Blue Shield or MVP, and again, it's the individual and family plans um, through the exchange, you need to buy these plans through Vermont Health Connect. And all of this information on how you do this is available on our website, the Green Mountain Care Board website, backslash tax credits. That will link you to the Vermont Health Connect website. And please, please, please check that out and tell your friends if you know anyone who could be eligible to check out how they can save money on, on their premiums. The board is obviously uh, focused on the triple aim and we want to make sure that folks have access to high quality care and to make sure that's affordable. And this is one of the ways we are spreading the word. So um, I also want to tell folks to check out our calendar. Our September press release was just posted recently, and so you can see future deliberations and other meetings we'll be holding throughout the month of September. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the opportunity for spreading some good news. Thank you so much, Susan, and um, we'll be continuing to spread that news throughout the entire uh, enrollment period, and I know the healthcare advocate is doing the same, so hopefully that word does get out. Uh, we don't have any minutes to approve, so I'm going to move on to our next agenda item, which is our hospital budget deliberations, which is a continuation of Wednesday's meeting. Uh, again, this is day two of our annual cycle of hospital budget deliberations. As a reminder, our task is to review and then approve or modify the fiscal year 23 budgets for our 14 community hospitals. This past Wednesday, we voted on budgets for Southwestern, Northwestern, Copley, Gifford, and Mount Escutney. So today we're going to hear a staff analysis for Grace Cottage, uh, Rutland, NVRH, and the three UVM Health Network hospitals that operate in Vermont. That would be Porter, CVMC, and UVMMC. So if the board is comfortable today, we may vote on any of those six hospitals budgets today. Uh, Brattleboro, Springfield and North Country will be reviewed next Wednesday. Um, so board members, our first hospital to review will be Grace. If the board feels comfortable, we might wanna vote on Grace right away since that we had some review of Grace Cottage on Wednesday's meeting. 
My suggestion is that after that, we let Sarah run through her analysis of Rutland, NVRH, and the three UVM health network hospitals without attempting to vote. And then we take a 10 minute brief recess, come back and see if the board is comfortable voting on Rutland, NVRH, and or Porter. Then we take a longer recess for digestion of the CVMC and UVM material and also maybe digestion of lunch. Then we can come back this afternoon and discuss any of the hospitals we didn't vote on this morning and then discuss at greater length the CVMC and UVM budgets. Does that make sense to board members as a cadence for the day? Seeing nodding of heads, great. Okay, wonderful. And again, uh, like last meeting, if you have board members, if you have clarifying questions, please just raise your hand during Sarah's presentation so she can address them as she's going. I think that clarity will help. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Sarah Lindbergh, our Director of Health System Finance and her team. Sarah, floor is yours. Good morning. Uh, how's the screen sharing look? Okay, good. So we're able to see. Uh, these uh, were finalized moments ago and are currently being posted on our website by Kara. So uh, thank you to all. That's someone I woefully neglected to publicly thank yesterday. Kara has been a critical part of the team and uh, will be making a transition soon, which is uh, bittersweet. So, uh, so here we are. It's definitely September this morning. We are on our second day of deliberations. We are hoping to wrap things up um, next week on September 7th, but we also have the 12th and 14th uh, to meet our obligations to issue decisions by September 15th or make decisions issued by October 1st in writing. So we're going to continue where we left off. Uh, so just to reorient everyone to what we did this year, which is um, a departure, I think, from other years, is we took the materials from the guidance as written and came up with a way to frame our decision or recommendations for your decisions in a decision tree, because we love the word decision. Uh, but the first prong of that tree was to determine whether or not the hospitals were within the guidance. So it was a two year growth rate of 8.6% with no expectations that it would um, necessarily be split evenly. Um, but that was the guidance for the two years. Um, and then uh, we also voted on a new approach where due to so much of the uncertainty supporting these 22 budgets, that we would apply that test to um, the 22 projections to 23 uh, budgets so that we could have a better sense of where things actually would be growing. Um, so assuming that those were true, next we tested a set of uh, assumptions related to their workforce investments and expenses, uh, the utilization assumptions as well as the other inflationary growth assumptions to make sure they were within recommended benchmarks. And we also take a look at the charge request and see if that seems supported in the submission and uh, is supporting uh, what we consider to be an appropriate operating margin. So, or an operating margin that doesn't require, you know, we don't, we, how does that relate to the operating operating margin that was suggested? Um, as another reminder, uh, we, uh, upon the recommendations from uh, the state economists, Carr and Cavett, uh, we saw that uh, the recommended measures of inflation, probably most conceptually related to inflation uh, for a hospital budget pr uh, process would be personal consumption expenditures and health care and the producer price index by industry for general medical and surgical hospitals. There was a lot to digest in that report. This is by no means the final say, but for this very um, important task before us under a very aggressive timeline, this was what we thought was the most reasonable things. And we can see that the approved GMCB changes in charge. So that's the amount the charge master is allowed to grow, which may or may not be associated with the net increase in revenue. So that is the payer adjustment. So that price overall price charge master increase has been approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. And this is where that's triggered out related to inflation over the years. Um, and so there are times where the GMCB decision was higher than these lines. 
then there's a period where it's very close and sometimes in between these lines. Um, and then in fiscal year 21, it again seemed to climb above that line. Um, we also saw that uh, growth in the medical healthcare portion of some of these measures also seems lagged, uh, maybe due to deferral of care, but that's an area of future investigation. So any questions about kind of uh, the review on our background before we dig back in? Okay, <laughs> sounds good. Um, so then I last thing to review is that um, each of these decisions with it comes a set of standard budget conditions. So uh, we would approve the official uh, growth rate uh, and what the estimated total NPR FPP for that decision is, uh, decide on an overall charge increase. Um, we have a chance to look at all the data we need and check in as needed about the results as they're coming in and that we want them to um, come to us if there's any material changes to their budgets. We get to dictate the form and manner that we get the information we need um, and we want those audited financial statements. Uh, we want to ensure continued participation in sustainability planning. Um, and then, yeah, just basically uh, other boilerplate here, but the um, there is notice and opportunity to be heard, um, amendment provisions, uh, make sure we get this electronically, uh, and it doesn't constrain future decisions. Um, so that is the standard set of goods that come with uh, these conditions. So to review Grace Cottage, uh, this was uh, the kind of the final hospital that um, we had talked about last week. So their um, change in their overall budget, their NPR and FPP, I should say, was 15% um, uh, from their fiscal year 22 budget. However, that drops to 6.1% when they look at where they're expecting 22 to land versus the 23 budget. So it seemed like a more reasonable growth rate, certainly within the 8.6. Um, their compensation growth was within our benchmark of less than or equal to 13.8%. Uh, their other inflationary growth was quite low, 0.7%. Um, so that was there. Uh, we needed to investigate the utilization as the exhibit we were using for other payers was not um, available. Um, but their overall commercial rate uh, was 4.7% with an effect to uh, a negative 3.7 operating margin, which was the lowest um, among Vermont regulated hospitals. So their um, charge to inflationary growth has looked a bit different than uh, the rest of the statewide trends. Uh, and here we saw that the utilization assumptions for physician office visits uh, was the main driver of their utilization changes. Um, this is a 13% increase, uh, which is what we kind of wanted to make sure we looked at. And so um, because of the small numbers, there's just a ton of volatility in their physician office visits over time. So the, it's plus or minus 10%, basically, um, percent change over time. So um, that's, again, mostly a, a small numbers thing. Um, I'm sorry, 9.0% is the standard deviation. Um, so it's a little hard. Um, the other reason... I don't want to treat these numbers as gospel is that um, it looks like there's definitely some deviations in the utilization numbers that we haven't adapted for this versus what we've seen reported for other exhibits. Um, so I think that within a hospital over time, I'll, I'm a little bit comfortable looking at that. But in terms of comparing against hospitals, I want more information about how those why that's all different. I'm, you know, just don't want to I, I want to be based in fact here. So. So that's why we thought the 13% um, seemed within, you know, historical trends, haven't seen major problems and, you know, their budgeting assumptions over time, you know, they um, have been pretty close um, uh, in that way, consistent, I should say. Um, so, yeah, so we were moving that this budget were to be approved as submitted um, with a 15% charge increase um, and an NPR FPP uh I'm sorry, that's the, uh, pardon me, approve a 15% increase uh, in their budget NPR with a 5% change to the overall charge. So uh, that's uh, the additional material we had to review uh, for Grace Cottage. So I was gonna take a pause here, um, Sarah, thank you for that, because this is a repeat from Wednesday to see if 
board members might be ready to make a motion on this particular budget. I think then we'll go through the rest of the uh, presentation without those votes, just to allow people to digest, board members to digest. But since this was something we already went through Wednesday and this was a repeat, I thought perhaps there might be uh, some preparedness for a motion. Throw that out there. Or have questions, additional questions for Sarah at this time. Tom Pelham. I can figure out how to get my hand down. Um, so one thing that's popped up uh, since we went through the grace material um, last time is this letter from the uh, AHS secretary uh, talking about um, uh, additional funds that might be coming or are coming to the table here. And one of them is a, a one time twenty three point seven million dollar uh, dish. And so I was going through the um, you know, our material material just to see which hospitals got dish because the letter said for those that got dish and I got down to the end of the list and there were only 13 hospitals on my list. And I went back through and found that um, Grace does not have any dish payment. Um, and I'm not quite sure I understand why, but I'm just wondering if anyone has talked to them about this effort on the part of the state or if they had any one at the table when these issues were being discussed. Um, I'm just worried that, you know, on the one hand, we have the biggest hospitals accruing a lot of money and the smallest hospital getting none. And uh, because they're, they, they aren't obviously a, a, um, a medical school um, and for some reason they're um, uh, they're not a participant in DISH and that I don't understand. And I, I kind of want to make sure that. That uh, Grace is, knows that this is going on um, so that they uh, they can say, hey, look, it's not a big deal to us. We're not a DISH hospital or. Whatever, yeah, I, 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 yeah, I, I don't mean to interrupt. Um, I just was reading my notes on this, and it says that um, Grace Cottage opted out of the dish in fiscal year 22. So I, I don't know the details behind that decision, um, but that that's the reason they're not getting any additional. Um, it's because they opted out of the program or the the mechanism for the year. Right, um, but uh, but but has anyone talked to them in the context of now? What's going oh, on now? Um, I, I have not because if I, I mean, uh, yeah, I guess I don't know how that would be actionable from where we're sitting. And um, I, I know what the, the, the impact of their fiscal 22 budget is, which is zero. So that that was kind of what I needed to digest for now. Um, but yeah, I think that as part of all our conversations, like thinking about DISH and its use is going to be a major component of any kind of 167 work. Um, if I may interrupt, Sarah, I see Mike Del Treco from the Vermont Hospital Association with his hand raised. So I wonder if he might offer some clarity here. I will allow uh, any clarity that you have on this particular topic. Sure. Um, board Member Pelham, thank you for your questions. The 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 dish rules are pretty complex and and there is um, there are certain requirements to be eligible for dish payment and that's the opt out thing uh, that Sarah was talking about. I personally have reached out to Grace Cottage. They are aware of this um, and I have also uh, had discussions with AHS to see if there's any support for the for the hospitals that you mentioned that are not receiving a dish payment to see if there's any way to have um, uh, some support for fiscal year 22 losses. Hopefully that adds some um, uh, clarity or information to your question. Thank you, Mike. It it does. I just want to make sure that that that, that they're aware of all this and uh, from your representation, uh, they're well aware of it. Uh, uh, it's just it's unfolding so fast that uh, <laughs> little little Grace Cottage could kind of get lost in the shuffle down there and uh, I just wanted to make sure that that wasn't going to happen. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Thank I you. See, I see Tom Walsh's hand also raised, so. Um, just a, a, a little bit more um, background with DISH. It stands for Disproportionate Share Hospital and it's um, Medicare calculation. It is complicated and I'm no expert, but the disproportionate amount means that 
from Medicare's standpoint, the hospital has a, dis a disproportionate amount of people receiving Medicaid, Medicare, and living below the poverty line. So it, it's disproportionate to what's expected for a similar hospital in a similar region. So that might help um, with the definition. I hope it does. Thank you, Tom. Um, I'm just not sure if, if you all can both lower your hands so I know that you're, thank you. Tom Pelham, do you still have another question then for Sarah? Well, you're on mute. Um, no, I, I, I don't. I, I'm, I'm happy that, uh, you know, uh, from what Michael said is that, um, you know, uh, that Grace Cottage is engaged in conversation. Um, I just worry that, you know, they are such a small entity that when you've got UVM and all the big wigs kind of talking about, you know, all these opportunities, uh, with money that somehow they've recently found. Um, that uh, that Grace Cottage uh, didn't get lost in the shuffle, and um, I'm under the impression that 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 has not happened. Thank you for that. Um, so, Tom, if you could lower your hand, that will help me know when you have another question. Uh, are there any other board members that have questions for Sarah on Grace Cottage? And I'm assuming that Tom's still trying to lower his hand. <laughs> uh, is there any board member that would want to make a motion about Grace Cottage's budget? I will move we approve Grace Cottage's budget as submitted with a 15% increase from fiscal year 22 to 23 for budgeted NPR FPP, a 5% increase to overall charges and subject to the standard conditions as presented to the board. Second. Do I have a second on that? Second. Second by Tom Walsh, okay. Is there any further discussion on the motion on the floor? And I do see Tom Pelham, your hand is raised. It's not raised, but you're- I think, I think I can actually um, lower it, Tom. Let me try. There we go. Excellent, thank you, Robin. Is there any discussion on this motion on the board? No, okay, I will open it up for public comment at this time. The motion would be to approve Grace Cottage Hospital's budget as submitted. Is there any public comment at this time? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands raised by anybody in the public. So at this point, all those in favor of approving Grace Cottage's budget as submitted, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing no opposition, so let the record show that it was unanimous in favor of approving Grace Cottage's budget as submitted. Okay, thank you for that. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Sarah, to go through. And I, as I suggested, I think we go through, let Sarah run through all the slides, and then we can take a brief recess and see if we come back and are ready to vote on any of the first few hospitals that uh, Sarah runs through at this point. Go ahead, Sarah. Sure. Uh, so, uh, Northeastern Vermont Regional Hospital uh, requested a budget to budget increase um, of 13% in their NPR slash FPP, which uh, if you look at the projection to the budget, it's 7.6 with a charge increase of 10.7%. Uh, However, uh, the estimated uh, commercial effective rate was a little bit below that at 10.5% which uh, they are using to support a 0.2 operating margin. That's quite low, uh, relatively speaking. Uh, and their NPR growth met that threshold. Their compensation growth was uh, a little bit above median and their inflationary growth was also quite low. So that tells us there's probably some stuff with travelers maybe um, that we're not disentangling. Um, so the utilization assumption actually changed. Uh, there was a, I didn't pick up an error in the spreadsheet. So the utilization increase is actually 7% instead of 14.7%. So right there, that's a major shift. Uh, that's important to note. Uh, we will look at their um, charge approval uh, versus the inflationary growth. So somewhat similar pattern uh, to what was seen statewide. 
except that that last uh, segment of the line dips down where statewide it actually dips up quite a bit. So, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm, that's the 22. Uh, yeah, this looks like the access might be a little bit. Uh, that should be going down for the um, 23. So I'll apologize for that. Uh, we'll get that fixed. Um, um, so again, we corrected the error in the appendix. Uh, they attribute their growth to um, increased acuity of the inpatient stays. So uh, people are still having larger or longer average lengths of stay. Um, and uh, I found that uh, they also attributed increases in fusion drugs and imaging was a major increase uh, for that growth. Um, they also have an issue that's a little bit for us to cleanly adjust for in that uh, they did have a provider uh, transfer uh, with for a podiatrist. And so because it was due to a retirement, it's hard to kind of level that out. Um, there was a someone they wouldn't, didn't recruit for, which is why they had the provider come in. So that's adding 490 to their um, NPR in fiscal year 23, but it's not clean to add to fiscal year 22. So that's a little bit funky there. So based on these attributes, um, we didn't see um, evidence to recommend a change based on these findings. It seemed like it was justified. Um, they also do a pretty good job of um, their forecasting historically for utilization. So, um, so we were going to recommend for discussion uh, later, but uh, the recommendation would be to approve this one as submitted as well. All right, any questions, comments, concerns about that before we move on to the next hospital? Okay. So moving on to Rutland Regional Medical Center, uh, they were one of the hospitals that uh, came in with a mid-year rate request uh, that was denied for fiscal year 22. So they were um, well aware um, of the budgetary changes they were experiencing. So their fiscal year 22 budget ended up being quite conservative uh, compared to what actually has happened so far in the fiscal year. Um, so again, that's really evident when we compare their budget to budget growth of 16.1% in NPR to the projected values for 22 to the 23 budget, which is 4.8, um, about half of the um, request uh, in the guidance. Uh, and they have um, a charge request of 17.8. However, it turned out um, that the effective rate or request um, was quite was quite a bit lower. 10.8 um, was what they expected the effective commercial rate to be. So it's important to know that charge number is is higher than the likely effect on commercial rate payers. Uh, so the growth again, once you adjust for the projection, is 4.8 percent. They're um, given the uh, quite um, the, it's a serious investment they've made in their workforce. The compensation gro growth was within um, uh, the recommended guidelines at 1.2% and their other inflationary growth at 0 0.3. So that is um, showing some, some uh, you know, real discipline in trying to um, keep those numbers within benchmarks. Utilization was 8.2%. That is budget to budget. So a lot of that is just um, being conservative in the 22 budgeting, which we'll walk through in a moment. Um, and so the 10.8 rate supports a 2.6 operating margin. Um, not sure how to interpret that um, for the board. So just putting it as something to investigate here. So when we look at their uh, relationship of what the GMCB has decided compared to um, what inflation has been, we can see that uh, they have a very low dip in fiscal year 17. Um, that charge was approved as submitted at negative uh, 5.1%. Uh, I didn't get a chance to go back and check the record. Often when we see something like that, it's uh, related to an enforcement action. So I didn't get a chance to check um, that. But uh, that said, um, dipping that low um, is likely to have an impact for years to come. So um, you know it's hard to say what the longer term effects of that is without some deeper analysis, which I have uh, uh, haven't had a chance to dig into as much as I'd like, um, but uh, I do feel very confident that in terms of utilization. Hey, Sarah, so, can oh, I yeah? just yeah, interrupt you for a minute? Yeah. Um, 
Rutland actually had come in with themselves with a rate cut because their utilization had been high. So they self-adjusted. <laughs> uh, so I thought I'd just chime in with that historical okay, explanation. Great. So yeah, so that's, that's thank you. So woof, saved myself a lot of legal research, which I'm not great at. Um, <laughs> and so, <laughs> uh, so that's important that these percent changes um, we don't have reflected here of what. So, you know, um, if it's already too high, maybe a low percent, or, too high is not the rate of frame that you know if it's relatively higher or relatively lower those you know those percentages can mean different things so just percent change is always tricky that way <clears throat> so thank you um and so uh yeah so again uh the estimates in the, the fiscal year 22 budget uh were quite conservative um so the G the gross patient revenue so here we're talking about gross revenue because that's a better way to get at utilization changes because um, it evens out the payer differential. So that's why we're talking about the change in growth. So that was 9% higher than they budgeted so far in fiscal year 22, which is a, a big delta from what they historically would be um, tracking. Um, so when you look at that, where we're starting from the utilization uh, currently to what the 23 budget is, it's actually a decrease of 0.8%. So expecting some of that kind of pent up stuff to slow down. So um, actually seems quite reasonable when you kind of put it in that context. Uh, and, you know, again, we see long term trends in, in their accuracy. You know, they've been within 2% of their budget for, you know, the past 10 years, which is not easy to do. Um, so we did not think that utilization uh, assumptions warranted a recommended change uh, to the budget as submitted. Uh, we also heard in their testimony uh, as well as their narrative um, that they are having some significant financial losses. Uh, they were projecting a loss of $25 million in the current fiscal year and when they presented to you, uh, which is includes a $12 million operating loss. Uh, they also outlined how some of these actually breach their debt covenants, which might bring greater costs in the system if those are breached and not able to be rectified with their lenders. Um, and then they also have taken very seriously trying to measure productivity improvements and they're using, you know, the pre-pandemic 2019 as their baseline and um, have estimated that they've already, you know, gained 17% based on those measures. Uh, they also have a notable plummet in their day's cash on hand um, between their fiscal year 21 actuals and the projection for fiscal year 22. Um, the rise that they're budgeting or trying to hit for 23 feels, um, you know, achievable and, and, and responsible um, compared to what we're seeing across the system. Um, and then we see that those margins, so the total margin is projected to be negative 8% um, and the operating margin at negative 3.8%. So they're trying to get those back to um, about two and a half percent in their budget, a little bit um, north of that for each, but uh, in line. So that says there's you know not a lot expected that's not related to um, operations. Uh, they they also said in their testimony that they they expected the impact of the final IPS rule to um, increase Medicare revenue by about six hundred thousand dollars. If you were to apply that um, based on one percent of the commercial rate, it would go down by half a percentage point. Uh, we also were um, able to see the estimated dish payments for fiscal year twenty three and noticed that there was a tenth of a percent. Delta there. So um, what they are getting is uh, less than what was in their budget by that. So that's why um, if you take those two factors into account for what we know, that the net uh, rate effect would be 0.4 percentage points. <laughs> um, so those are kind of the things we could find that tied to the submission that we um, might consider. So uh, we would recommend that the budget be approved as a, uh, the, I'm sorry, the NPR um, FPP to be approved as submitted. And then we wanted to provide a few options. These, this is not meant to be um, an exhaustive list, just a few kind of concepts to think about. 
Um, so if you could approve the, the NPR FPP request as submitted, and you could also approve the charge request as submitted, again, it was 17.8% charge increase, which is uh, effective commercial increase estimated to be 10.7%. Uh, you could also modify within that range, either just add uh, a tenth of a percent for the shortage of DISH in fiscal year 23 budget, or just deduct uh, the IPS, uh, which would take it down to 17.3%, which would be a range of 10.2 to 10.8 in that effective commercial rate. So pretty pretty minor, but uh, you know that's the what was clear in the the record as we saw it. Any questions or clarifying uh, comments uh, for Rutland before we? Oh yes, Robin. Um, so, in thinking about the options, if we were to adjust the charge, do you have? And it's totally fine for you to say no. <laughs> a, a thought on um, keeping the MPR as submitted, even if the charge. Um, charges decreased given the low that the utilization assumption which is an actual decrease yeah so we're saying we think that their their patient revenue makes sense but if you want to adjust in their commercial charge or related to the commercial charge how much of that would be coming from that payer now it does have impacts on other payers so it's not necessarily a one-to-one -one adjustment here um so you know yeah, but that's the idea, is that uh, it's just trying to shift where that uh, revenue would come from. Thank you. Yes, board member Pelham. I'm going to learn to put my hand down sometime today, but uh, um, at least I know how to get it up, which is uh, problematic for you probably. <laughs> but um, so how how does this new dish endeavor that we were told about um the other day uh factor into um your numbers here i i think the dish number you're talking about is what was already in in play um and not the additional dish money because uh you know rutland's rutland you know rutland's dish is 3.4 million dollars out of the current um 22 million so my guess is if they're going to do a one time at 23.7 rutland's amount uh would be another 3.4 million that isn't in play in this discussion um and so i'm wondering what your thoughts are uh, about that yeah um so i didn't see any portion of their 23 ask specifically tied to their 22 losses so I think that that is helping to mitigate the significant loss that they're going to take, um, but I don't think it would be necessarily appropriate to adjust uh, their 23 rate since it's not a factor in the request. So is that going to be your position as we go through all these hospitals? So that, not that, that's this. that's not true for every hospital. Some include a term for those fiscal year 22 losses. So I think that's a different conversation. OK, um, and one other question I had is just, you know, as as one of the things that we in past endeavors, budget uh, hospital budget endeavors, we talked a lot about payer mix. And as we go through this, um, that seems to have been diminished as a factor. And so I'm I'm looking at Rutland and in terms of uh, the 22 commercial um, system wide um, that was in the documents they submit, submitted to us that are on adaptive, uh, Rutland was in at 7.8% of um, the uh, commercial amount. And now um, with their request for 20, 23, they will move up to 9.1 percent, and I, I, those, those shifts are small, but they're powerful, um, and and especially because there's real money uh, in in commercial. And I'm just wondering if you have any, any uh, uh, kind of insight as to the consequences of shifts like that, because it's happening with some other big, big hospitals, and I'm just wondering where where it takes us down the road 
Yeah, I think those are all really fair questions. And one of the things on the top of my list is thinking about how we can get our decisions to be more um, related to revenue decisions. Per, you know, so this change in charge, as we showed last uh, last time, is is very poorly correlated with the actual change in revenue. And so like, and so we're kind of like trying to change the weather by moving the weather vane, you know, like, <laughs> and it's just, I think we have to really think about what, what the goals of what we think we need to do about those payer differentials and how we can think about them in a budgetary context. Because I do think the other complexity is that um, you know, revenue doesn't necessarily follow a patient on a one-to-one -one basis. There's some kind of cash flow and, and, you know, estimation. So we need to think about the most appropriate way to measure these things. And I don't know if it's, yeah, I think the causation piece is, is a different thing that um, might affect that, but uh, it's an important thing to note. I don't know that the the budget process as we've have it currently set up is going to be able to address some of those cons really important concerns. Yeah, and uh, it and yeah, like I uh <laughs> I think that uh we'll see some some graphs later that look at the ratio of net um revenue to the gross revenue and and you'll see how kind of that tool has drifted over time. Um, it, it's a, uh, yeah, and I think that uh, at the end of the day, you're talking about the impact to the rate payer, which is another prong of the GMCB mission. And the more we can kind of think about aligning goals across those pro processes that are appropriate to the lever, um, the better off we'll be as a regulator. Last question, is my hand down? All right. All right. I put it down for you, Tom. I'll just you put did? it down for I did. Oh, I I'll thought just put I it did. Down I for you. So, I hit that something would be that said lower hand. <laughs> okay. Um, any other Rutland uh, questions, comments, concerns? Okay. So, uh, we're going to do a little shift here and we're in a, a very kind of liminal hospital here because uh, Porter Medical Center is part of the UVM health network uh, filing. So they use kind of a, a common methodology across the three hospitals. However, um, the decision tree sugared out a little bit different for Porter than the other two um, hospitals in that network, which is CVMC and UV the University of Vermont Medical Center. And so uh, we want to take Porter first um, because they are the last hospital whose uh, projection in 22 to their 23 budget change in NPR was within the guidance at 4.4%. Um, if you look at budget to budget, it was 10.9%. So if we look at their uh, summary of test results, we'll see um, again their growth from projection to budget was within the, the guidance. Their compensation growth uh, was a little bit above median at 8.9%, uh, but their other inflationary growth was quite low at 0.6%. Uh, there was also a mathematical, um, uh, I need to get those tables easier to use, but uh, the, it was including a row it shouldn't have, so their actual utilization assumption was 6.8%. Um, and we wanted to be clear, similar to Gifford, um, that this hospital has a relationship with its nursing home, Helen Porter, and so it helps to support that organization. So if you take into account Helen Porter, the hospital's margin drops to 3.2%. So that 5.7 is also supporting um, Helen Porter. Um, so we'll take a look at some of those factors. So for all of the UVM Health Network hospitals, another difference is that they um, both provide the change in charge, which again is on that charge master and, and may or may not be very well associated with the um, actual change in commercial revenue. Um, so they also present what they call the um, eff commercial effective rate. So what they're actually expecting to do um, in their commercial negotiations um, or budgeting to do, I should say. 
Um, so the um, top one is the same as we've seen for every hospital. That's the change in charge. The bottom one is uh, the change in that commercial effective rate for the years in which it was filed. So it wasn't always filed. They started filing it that way for fiscal year 17. So you can see that um, the trends uh, for those uh, charges and commercial effective rates can look quite different. Um, and that it uh, looked like it was above the estimated inflation in fiscal year 17, but has been pretty close uh, to inflation since for the commercial effective rate. Um, so when we look at the net patient revenue, instead of the gross change in revenue, utilization is a 3.6% change um, from budget to budget. So they they uh, report the components of their utilization change in gross patient revenue. Um, this is in the reconciliation table where we look at the net patient revenue. So what are they actually collecting? So if you look at the 22 budget and compare it to the 23 budget, it's a 3.6% change. But again, here we see that there's likely some conservatism in the 22 budgets at work, because if we look at the increase from their 22 projections, to their 23 budget, it's a 0.7% increase, which seems um, reasonable um, in line with other estimates. Um, most of the increases are associated with um, operating room procedures, which they are budgeting to return to 2021 levels. You can see that they took a dip in fiscal year 22. Um, so seems like a relatively, um, uh, you know, makes sense that for the budgeting purposes. So we didn't see any evidence that uh, their utilization assumptions were not supported in their submission. So we didn't recommend a change based on utilization assumptions. Um, so for each uh, UVM health network hospital, they provided this table. We'll spend just a little time to talk about it. Um, so the fiscal year 22 cost inflation is, um, you know, not the way we've been talking about inflation. Um, you know, I would, you know, the way I would say this is expense increases or expense changes. Um, so these are the, so some of these costs are related to more care. Some of these costs are related to inflation on things costing more, so, you know, so that the, there's other factors in here than just, you know, inflation as we've been talking about it through the economist lens. So they include um, a, a term for what they um, are essentially losing in fiscal year 22, which for um, Porter is uh, $6.8 million. However, you will notice that their um, 23 budget does not include any adjustment for that. They do not put that into their rate at all for the 23 request. So when they look at the um, the cost inflation they're expecting in their budget, um, they're looking for 3.9 million or 4.0 million dollars with rounding, um, which they put into a nine month um, commercial rate year for an 11.45% increase. Now you'll see that um, the total cost inflation is 5.6 million. So they've deducted some things that they um, are taking out and some of these still involve some risk. So for instance, you'll notice there's an ACO rate increase. So they have built in their budget a certain expectation of their performance in the ACO model. That's not something that's certain. So um, the things that they've deducted out um, are also, you know, some of them are at risk. So these are not for sure things. So I just wanna be clear that it's not like they've been able to book all of this um, reduction. So these are, you might consider it cost savings or, you know, that's the way some other hospitals might talk about those kind of adjustments. So there, so there's risk there. They, they don't have for sure that, you know, 1.6 million. Um, yeah, and so then, so for Porter, the, the total and the rate matches just fiscal year 23. So fiscal year 22 is, is a separate deal. Um, so for all these reasons, uh, we recommend that uh, this one would also be approved as submitted. Uh, we think there's sufficient uh, evidence in the record uh, to support their uh, increase. But uh, that is and, uh, and again, to note that this would be the last hospital we're discussing whose uh, NPR request came within guidance. All right. Any Porter Medical Center questions before we move on to our next phase? Great. 
All right, so here we go to, again, those whose 22 projections to 23 budgets, NPR, FPP growth was in excess of 8.6%. So there were one, two, three, four, five hospitals, three of which um, are actually under uh, the current uh, budget. And so that kind of makes the uh, change greater. Uh, we're going to try to tackle the other two um, network hospitals today, Central Vermont and the University of Vermont, and look at the last three hospitals when we next meet. So um, again, so uh, their budget to projection is 3% under, so they're 3% under their fiscal 22 budget. They are asking for a budget to budget increase of 7.3% uh, and an overall charge, uh, a projection to budget change of 10.7%. Uh, their long-term growth um, is pretty in line with um, the all-pair model goals, as we discussed last week, um, that is really measuring a quite a different thing than hospital budgets. So staff is recommending more investigation into their relationship before we um, put more um, attention on that specific factor. Um, and then here again, uh, the change in charge is 10%, but the um, effective commercial rate request is 14.52%. Um, that's close that's uh, above the median you know uh close to the closer to the max uh they are uh budgeting a one percent operating margin however with that rate uh their utilization assumptions included a decrease of one percent seemed reasonable and supported in the submission uh their other inflationary growth was also projected to fall and their compensation growth was below the median so when we look at their um, decisions, so again, as a network hospital, we have that charge request, which is not so well associated with commercial uh, revenue, and then the effective charge that was approved by the Green Mountain Care Board. So um, here we'll see that again, that 18 effective commercial rate was approved as submitted. It was submitted as 0.2 uh, tenth of a percent. Um, and uh, we see that this uh, trend in the commercial effective rate from 19 to 21 has been uh, above the estimated inflation rate. Part of that may be um, residual from the very low ask in fiscal year 18. So we'll just spend a minute here to talk about gross patient revenue versus net patient revenue. Um, just to be clear, when I'm using NPR on this slide, it's not the same NPR slash FPP that you're making a decision on. The only adjustment I've made is for deductions uh, based on contracts. So there's, you know, the the, the build amount and then what the actual um, revenue is. So that's what I mean here when I'm saying NPR. And so the gross patient revenue is going to be um, those build amounts. So they're the same for everyone um, for the same service, whether they have they're paying out of pocket, they've got Medicare, they've got Medicaid, that gross amount is going to be the same. Um, if every patient got the exact same service in the exact same amount, we would see that be even across payers for gross values, but they they aren't, and that's because they're doing different intensity stuff or they're doing different amounts of stuff. So that's why when we talk about adjusting values um, for a population, that's the type of thing you're trying to get apples to apples. And then NPR is when the payment variation comes in. So we've taken off the um, contractual deductions to see what proportion of that gross patient revenue um, is actually hitting their net patient revenue. And so you will see, uh, since we have data back to 2002 fairly reliably, we see that um, those used to be a lot more tightly associated and they've drifted more and more over time. Um, in the case of Central Vermont Medical Center, the gross patient revenue has increased more than the net patient revenue. Um, and according to their budgetary assumptions, they're expecting, you know, 38 uh, percent of their gross patient revenue to actually be collected. Uh, another important note is that when we move to FPP, money comes off this chart that's a different payment mechanism. So, you know, there is um, $56 million in their 50, their 23 budget that's just been taken off this chart and it's being paid for in a different way. So that's another kind of trade-off we have when we think about moving to these fixed payments is uh, we get 
our trends start to deviate. Um, and so then this is where we get into how things look different by the type of payer. So again, if these patients got the same amount of stuff and got the same stuff done, all those bars would theoretically be equal. Um, so for the, um, the top of the bar, we're comparing those differences. So what's different in how many people came to that hospital? What's different in how much was done to them, how sick they were, stuff like that. And then how much of that bar is filled up is the proportion that they're collecting. And so for the fiscal year 23 budgets, 15% um, of the gross patient revenue is expected to be collected for Medicaid, 63% for commercial, and 21% for Medicare. So that's um, the pressure that we talk about when we talk about this differences in payment. Now, why that is, I think, is a separate conversation, but this is what it is. So I think that this takes a little time to digest, so I'm going to stop talking for a minute. <laughs> If I could jump in with a quick question or comment, yeah. um, just to, to um, and I, obviously this is not to answer today to your just last point. It seems mm -hmm. like something happened with their Medicare reimbursement between 17 and 18. So I think perhaps so after we're, we're finished with this yeah. process, we could have a chat with CVMC so, to see if we can understand that. So, so that's going to be fixed perspective payment coming off okay. this chart. Got it. Okay. <laughs> yep. That makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, no, glad I could answer it. Hey, Baxi's, you got me earlier. <laughs> so Sarah, how does um, the fixed perspective payment for Medicaid fit into this? Uh, also the off the chart. Yep. So if they- Off if, the chart. Yeah. So but, it's just, but there's yeah. not as much deviation there as as it was with Medicare, Medicare dropped from what forty four percent to the medic yeah to twenty nine, and I don't see a, a cliff uh, on the Medicaid side. Yeah, I'm looking at the numbers here. Well, I think part of it is um, we have to remember that really only about half of Medicaid spending is in um, the terms of the all payer model fixed perspective payments and not all of those payments. And it's also just, you know, fewer dollars in general. Um, but yeah, yeah. Hmm. I worry sometimes that uh, we're getting so uh, disaggregated uh, in how we look at stuff that it's, you know, it's it's becoming a force that's impenetrable. Um, just, just a comment. This is a uh, uh, this is a lot of moving parts here, and I think even for the Jeff Cars and Tom Cavetts of the world, <laughs> you know, it's hard to follow. And uh, I'm sitting here thinking about it's hard to follow, and I'm just wondering how an average citizen, you know, who. Uh, so I, I just a word of caution that at some point this gets so complex. Maybe it's accurate, but it's so complex that people can't understand it. It's a tough balancing act because I, yeah, I definitely, um, I'm doing my best to make it as accessible as I know how, but I, it's an area, it's an opportunity for improvement. I'll be on my next performance review. I do think, I think this is really helpful. I think that we need to figure out how to incorporate fixed perspective payment and, you know, when it really took off so we can have an apples to apples comparison over time. It's just, you know, even just noting um, the proportion of revenue that came from fixed perspective payment over time or something like that so that uh, it's clear. But this is really helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Um, this, is, this is Tom Walsh. Before you, before you go, thanks. Um, I also think you mentioned this ahead of time, and you're exactly right, that the discussion about causation, does a change in one of these bars make the other change? There's um, common misconceptions about that, and there are easy, wrong assumptions about it that we should discuss further um, in the future. All right. Um, like I said, I know it's a lot to digest, um, and you probably have had very little time with it. So. Um, 
yeah, and in that tension between keeping it kind of understandable and uh, actionable is is one I'll continue working on. Um, so these are the same metrics we had looked at for Rutland. So um, similarly, we see um, depleting cash on hand. Um, this this has kind of been declining more steadily for, since fiscal year 20 in the case of CVMC, um, but staying constant between the 22 projection in their budget at um, you know between 80. 81 and 82 uh, days, which is not uh, not a number that feels comfortable, I think, for most people. Uh, and then if you look at their total and operating margin, that big bounce in 9.7 is going to be related to um, you know some of the COVID stuff, um, but the operating margin um, has been negative uh, for the past three fiscal years, projected to be negative again, including inclusive. And so um, the ask is to try to get their operating margin up to 1%. Um, and so just want to take into account their mid-year requests in, in terms of thinking this through. So we've kind of got two sets of uh, ways to look at that. So each row on that is uh, a, a kind of budget cycle or a, or a revenue portion snapshot. So there's their approved budget originally in for fiscal year 22, the mid-year approved budget for fiscal year 22, where their per current projection was in their 23 budget and what the 23 budget actually is. So uh, for their um, gross patient revenue, the original budget, um, uh, so it's an 11% growth from their original budget, 8.9% um, growth from their uh, mid-year approved budget, and a 12.2% uh, growth uh, from projection to budget. But if you look at the NPR, that drops to a 10.7% increase, as we discussed. Um, which, uh, you know, they've actually been pretty close, uh, relatively speaking, to their original um, budget on the NPR. Uh, we do expect utilization uh, of 2.1% from the projection to the budget, so I don't think we talked about that portion of it earlier, so that's going to explain some of the, the increase. Um, and then uh, here, so here, this is uh, that same chart that we saw includes the budget risk, but the difference here is that um, 4.1, I guess I was in Europe when I wrote that, $4.1 million of fiscal year 22 losses are included in the 23 rate. Um, so that uh, if you add the 8.3 estimated um, expense increase for fiscal year 23 to that 4.1, the overall component in their budget is 12.4%, which is a commercial effective ask of 14.52%. So because they did include these fiscal year 22 losses in their budget, it felt responsible and appropriate of us to include the additional dish payment that they got for fiscal year 22, which has a rate effect of 1.59%, reducing the um, fiscal year 22 cost inflation to 2.4 million or a 2.35% request. Um, so that would basically change um, the overall request from 14.52 down to 12.93, which is a proportionately 11% reduction. Uh, here, though, we pause for just a note that, you know, to the staff's knowledge, this would be the first time like a previous year's fiscal year loss would be included in a future year rate. So I think that's just an important thing to consider uh, in this deliberation. Uh, just, uh, you know, it, it unprecedented is kind of the buzzword. And I know this is one of those uh, unprecedented things that we've seen as a result. So again, not an exhaustive list, but some potential uh, options. Um, approve the budget as submitted. Um, approve the budget with an adjustment to the cost inflation for DISH. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I, 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 those bullets are a little inaccurate. I'll fix those, that's slide 44. So if you just uh, adjust it for the 22 DISH, that re reduce it um, by 1.5%, bringing the effective rate down to 12.93%. Whoops, 
Um, if you do not account for the cost inflation at all, that would reduce uh, the ask by 4.1 million uh, and would reduce it by 3.94%. So I'll get those corrected for the record. <clears throat> So uh, after accounting for that dish, if you do not include that term, they would still have 1% of their budgeted fixed perspective payment slash NPR that would not have a funding source um, that we know of. So that would add, um, they would need to find that funding somewhere else. So we don't really know, have a, you know, those are just the options to kick around for Central Vermont Medical Center, um, but that is uh, the recommendation or I'm sorry, lack of recommendation, the suggested motion language once you make a really hard decision. Mm. All right, any questions or things you wanna go back to for Central Vermont? So this I suspect, is- I was just gonna, Oh, go ahead, Tom. I was just gonna say, I suspect we're gonna have a lot of discussion and questions as we're digesting this. So I just, yes. oh, go ahead, Tom Walsh. Yeah, go ahead. No, I just uh, uh, wondered when uh, would be best to, to talk about a little bit of that, particularly the carry forward. Um, should we wait till, uh, what, what's your preference, Chair? Would you like to hold discussion on that or have that now? You know what, I think, why don't we let Sarah go through the, just one more hospital, and, and then I think we'll take, uh, at that point, I think we'll, it's just UVM that's left, I think we'll take a 10, 10 15 minute recess, and then I think we can come back. Um, well, actually, it's, it's up to you. If you have clarifying questions or questions about how that carry forward works, I think it's fine to do it now, and then we're going to have much more lengthy discussion, I think, this afternoon about all of these um, components and all of the options within these hospitals, but certainly why don't you ask your questions now that have to do with the carry forward that'll help us digest the material. Okay, um, just a couple things to consider with it. Um, Sarah, what I've heard you, what I've heard and what I think I was reading in the, in the submissions was that um, losses from the prior year are put into the budget for the next in an attempt to make up for those losses, right? So that would mean somebody needing care in 2023 would be paying more than they would have in order to cover care delivered to somebody in 2022, which is not the way, that's, that's not a gold standard, that's not a industry standard. Um, it would, so if that's not equitable, it would also make it, I need to think about this with you all more, but on first blush, that would make it impossible to slow the growth because the loss would always be added forward, right? So, so it's fundamentally against what we're charged to do. Thank you, Tom. I'm just going to, I see Alga Bay from um, VVM Health Network has his hand raised. And so if there's any clarification here about the, the assumptions about the carry forward, uh, Mr. Gobey, you can speak to that. Thank you, Chair Holmes. And I will assume that I'm still under oath um, from the last meeting. Um, yes, yeah, so I think there's a critical distinction here to be made between carrying losses forward and what we're actually doing here and what was in our presentation we're actually carrying cost inflation growth forward. And so if you if you look at the um, presentation that we made, we're very specific about how much that is. And so when when prices go up in, in the FY22 year and we're unable to cover them, and, and those same prices go up again in our estimate for FY23, that total cost inflation amount has to be covered basically by volume times rate. So this is not losses carried forward. And, and the last point I wanna make is that when we did come for the mid-year, we felt the board was very clear to us that they didn't wanna reconcile the entire cost inflation from FY22 that we were experiencing. We had articulated that our average inflation 
um, estimate in the FY22 budget during the August hearing was 2.4%, but inflation had grown um, at above 8% nationally at that time of the mid-year, and that those costs we could not, um, we just could not cover. And so I agree with, with, with Member Walsh that we would not want to bring losses forward, and I understand his good reasoning, but this is literally the, the cost inflation to deliver services that is in FY22 and will remain in FY23 with the inflation that we'll see in that year. I hope, I hope I've made sense, uh, Chair Holmes. If not, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. Um, appreciate it. So are there any other questions from the board about the CVMC analysis by the staff? Okay, I'm not seeing any. Again, we'll come back to this, and I know this is a lot to digest, which is why I want to give us time to do that, preferably over lunch, I think, is going to, you know, at least at the very least, to really start to digest this. Um, so go ahead, Sarah, if you want to go with UVM. I think you're on mute, though. I could talk like that all day. Um, thank you for the correction. Uh, so here we are at EVM. Uh, so they have a variance between their projection and their budget of negative 5%. Um, some of that is going to be they're closer for, to their original budget, um, but uh, the didn't have as much time to get to the mid-year uh, number. So if we look at the budget to budget request, uh, it is 10.0. Uh, the 23 request is, uh, I'm sorry, the projection to 23 budget is 15.7%. Uh, I just realized that unlike the other hospitals that this access is not starting at zero. So that is making that growth look uh, disproportionate. That's not fair. They're actually very close to the um, all pair model growth rate. I'll also correct that in the recess and uh, get updated slides. Uh, so here, um, again, the charge request is not probably the most useful thing for us to spend time on. It's that effective commercial rate request, which is 19.9% to support a 2% operating margin. Um, their compensation growth uh, was among the highest. They also you know, have the highest need for um, staff. They're the largest and they also are doing the most technical work. So um, it was below our benchmark and their other inflationary growth was uh, pretty close to the median, a little bit higher than that. Um, and again, when we look at the utilization from budget to budget, which is not a great way to think about it uh, today, uh, it is 7.7%. So when we look at the approved uh, GMCB decisions uh, versus both the charge request and the commercial effective rate, uh, we see that trend. Uh, again, that uh, fiscal year 18 ask that's quite low uh, was approved as submitted. Um, I don't know that that's the rate that would have been submitted uh, it had it not been for some other factors going on with some overages in previous years. So uh, I think that's probably still being felt uh, by UVMMC. Um, but we can see that since then, uh, there hasn't been a ton of headroom for this hospital between inflation um, and what was decided for the commercial effective rate. Um, so here we see that again, that gross patient revenue um, and the net patient revenue. So in the case here, um, their growth has been uh, closer. Uh, they grown about a pretty similar rate. And we also have a lot more money that's come off this chart due to the value-based uh, care fixed perspective payments, which uh, is budgeted to be over $200 million in uh, fiscal year 23, which is a lot of things from the dollar store. Um, we can see that, uh, you know, overall that there's a greater amount um, of the net to the gross. And so as we'll see, that's largely a mix of uh, a result of kind of the payer mix. But we also see that um, there's a bigger dip um, in fiscal year 20. Uh, the COVID years uh, is got hit hard uh, for gross patient revenue here. Um, so when we again look at it by payer, uh, we see that um, the commercial and Medicare gross patient revenue are closer to one another than they were for CVMC. 
Um, and we also see a lot more uh, care and types of care or intensity amounts, uh, you know, charges uh, for proportionally to the Medicaid population here. Um, so, uh, or I'm sorry, just taller bars, more money there. <laughs> Uh, but we see a similar trends in that the proportion uh, that is collected for Medicaid is 10% of those gross charges, 17% uh, for Medicare and 67% for commercial. So that's kind of that uh, payment difference that we discussed a bit before. <clears throat> Financial trends, again, uh, we see that uh, very similar to Rutland, a, a substantial decrease between the projection for the current year from the 199 in fiscal year 21 uh, and still at a level that is concerning for fiscal year 23 at 128.9. Uh, the total margin, again, um, is not probably as close to the operating expenses as what's uh, being felt in terms of the NPR. And so we see uh, negative 2.5% uh, operating loss projected for the current fiscal year um, with a hope to return to 2% in fiscal year 23. All right, and when we compare again those stages of the 22 fiscal year, so the original budget um, was 1.5 million, which was adjusted up uh, a little bit in the mid year, um, where and their projection is coming in at 1.4 million. So uh, that's 15.7% growth to get to the a billion. Sorry. Yeah, no, sorry, gonna... billion. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm the worst at that. <laughs> billion. Remember Carl Sagan when I think of UVM. Um, okay, uh, whereas the growth uh, from their budget um, is 10.5%. So uh, they were, you know, relatively close to that um, original value. Again, time was not on the side to get up to that mid-year ask um, and see the gross patient revenue uh, numbers there just for reference. Um, so if we look at how utilization is expected to change uh, between the projection for fiscal year 22 and the 23 budget, utilization is expected to account for 3% of that. Um, so that is uh, an ambitious goal, but I felt like there was ample evidence and testimony and narrative about um, the very substantial measures that they're taking to address um, the needs of the community and try and uh, move things along. Uh, and so here I'll try to be a little bit more precise in my language, but uh, the cost inflation that UVM uh, says will persist um, from fiscal year 22 is estimated to be $48.6 million. Uh, and then additional cost inflation uh, that they're in, in their fiscal three, 23 budget of $77.2 million for a total of $125.9 million, uh, which translates to a 19.9% rate. So again, uh, that cost inflation for 22 is 48.6 million. So if we think that the additional dish uh, is appropriate to put towards that inflation, um, some of which is hard to know how much of it will subsist. It's, nobody knows. The economists that we talked to yesterday or earlier didn't know. <laughs> uh, but that's going to be an effective uh, impact to the rate of 1.555% which means that there'd still be $37 million of that cost inflation uh, not covered. Uh, so if you're going to make that adjustment, uh, that portion of the fiscal year 23 commercial ask, net effective commercial rate ask would decrease from 6.38 to 4.83. If you just keep fiscal 23 alone, that means uh, the overall change would usually be organized from min to max, 18.35% to 19.9%, uh, which is, represents an 8% reduction in that rate. <clears throat> so again, this, this is a new method. Uh, we heard some of the reasons why it looks different this year, um, par partially due to the decision uh, made at mid-year. Um, so then there's a lot of known unknowns uh, for the 23 numbers. Uh, so again, 77.3 million in cost inflation estimates. 
The IPS final rule may add two to three million. Um, that's a hard number to project uh, precisely, um, but that might have a effect of 0.35 to 0.52 on the commercial rate increase. Um, the outpatient final rule is not final. Uh, it won't be uh, in, before we're, our decisions are due, but that could add as much as eight to point eight to nine million, which would have an effect of 1.4 to 1.57 percent on that commercial rate. Um, and then, as uh, Tom, uh, Mitport board member Pelham mentioned earlier, uh, we did get a letter from uh, the our colleagues at uh, Diva, which is posted online, that said um, that you know they had every intent of requesting an additional 21 million in uh, GME money. However, that does need to be authorized. Um, it does not have a state match requirement, so we're very optimistic that that would get passed, but um, that's part of the reason that UVM is trying to figure things out by November 15th, um, but the hit or uh, the effect to the commercial rate increase would be 3.67%. So um, trying to factor in the potential range of these uh, would reduce the estimated cost inflation to 44.3 to 46.3 million or a 7.76 to 8.10 commercial rate increase for the fiscal year 23 portion. Again, a lot to digest. So again, just some options, uh, and I will also fix these slides um, to be clearer, uh, but uh, approve the budget as submitted. Um, you could approve the adjustment with an, a, 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 the DISH uh, adjustment to the fiscal year 22 cost inflation, which would result in a 10% NPR FPP increase and an 18.35% commercial rate approve the budget um, without any of the fiscal year 22 cost inflation um, and then approve an effective commercial rate in the 7.76 to 8.1 range, which would expose um, uh, still $37 million uh, for them to find, which uh, is over 2% of their NPR. <clears throat> um, a note about the self-restricted funds, um, both our colleagues at the Department of Mental Health and UVMMC, uh, or I should say HN, have uh, been in very close contact, are really working hard to address the critical mental health needs of our community. Um, if we were going to try to apply that 18 million today, you know, it would be about a 3% effect on the commercial rate. Um, however, uh, in staff's judgment, we think that it might be too soon to tell about the progress of that and that we would not recommend making an adjustment based on that today. Or when you vote, I should say. <laughs> so uh, that's just some some context. Uh, it's a lot of context and I know there's probably just more questions than answers for a lot of these things. However, um, I'm happy to address any other uh, questions or clarifications before recess here. Great, I'd like to open it up then to the board first for questions that the board might have. Tom Pelham, you have your hand raised. Excellent job. But you have to unmute yourself too. Couple of questions. Um, uh, you, when you were talking about the $18 million, uh, you trailed off. I, what was what was your recommendation, Sarah? My recommendation is that uh, that we should give more time to assess progress. Uh, it's a critical time with uh, quite a few irons in the fire, um, but we see quite a close collaboration with mental health. So uh, we would we would recommend not uh, making any adjustments. Would, would would you consider putting a clock on that? I mean, it's already been since 2018 that this uh, you know, and three million of it was spent for something that's never going to happen. And I'm just I, wondering. Yeah, yeah I, I think that um, as we heard for the past few weeks that um, providers have been dealing with so much um, that uh, and it has also I think 
made some adjustments to our mental health needs so that mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, I don't know what the right clock would be, but it, it feels hasty to do that today. Yep. And my second question has to do with uh, contractual amount obligations. Um, you know, in some of our discussions, uh, we talk about um, kind of the purchasing power that a hospital might have in, in a market. And, um, you know, and this gets into kind of a either or or both cost shift versus the versus the, uh, uh, the the kind of market power of a hospital. And so when you were looking at the uh, contractual obligations by each hospital, um, did you see any trend or tendency that would um, uh, indicate that one hospital has more mar mar market power than another? Uh, I did not do a comparative analysis. Uh, from uh, that's so, so it's something we can certainly explore. Um, I do think that. Um, yeah, I have to think about, uh, I worry because again, the, those gross patient numbers are already different. Um, that, that means that they're doing different stuff and, uh, would want to appropriately a case adjust, uh, for the intensity of the commercial care being delivered. Um, so I just need to think through, um, how much actionable information uh, I can provide material to your decision here. Are you set, Tom Pelham? Uh, yes, I'm set. Great, thank you. Are there other board questions for Sarah? Um, Sarah, may I ask you one? Um, I noticed that you have for the UVM Medical Center adjustments for the estimated impact of inpatient final rule and the possible impact of the outpatient final rule, but we don't have that for Central Vermont Medical Center. Yeah, they seemed, uh, I didn't get the exact numbers, they seemed much smaller. Um, we can certainly uh, ask for estimates for by hospital if that would help. Okay, that was my question, just trying to match up the two analyses. All right, so are there any more board questions at this time? No, okay. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up for public comment at this time, and um, and then we will break for a recess to be determined after we go through public comment to give the staff a chance to look over the slides, have the um, make any adjustments they need to make, and then also give the board some time to digest. And again, I think we will uh, not be voting on any of the hospitals that have greater than 8.6% this morning anyway. So we will have that discussion, larger discussion this afternoon. Mr. Gobey, I see your hand is raised. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you for the time. Just one point, um, Sarah, amazing job on, on this work here. The, um, the only thing I would say is the GME number is the gross number there is the investment that we put up for that. And so if, if you're calculating or, or considering that number, it's about half that would actually come to the UVM Health Network. And we can be precise about that if, if that's needed. And thank you. Actually, I will request that precision, if you would, Mr. Gobey, yeah. so that we can understand that. That would be we'll, really we'll, helpful. We'll, we'll get that to you pretty quick here. Thank you yep. so much. Absolutely. Ham Davis, I see your hand is raised as well. I'd just like to ask, th thank you, Madam Chair. I'd just like to ask Sarah, what, if I understood that correctly, would once all the discussion is over, is the number two uh, option for UVM amount to a $37 million cut in their budget? Is, is that, did I hear that correctly? Uh, we, there would be no adjustment to the budget, the F. PP and PR uh, would not be adjusted. It would just be the proportion uh, associated with the commercial rate. So we would say that money's coming from somewhere else. Where else? I, 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 that, I, okay, I'm just not. I'm just not clear on that. If they, if the, if they can't put it in the budget, uh, if they, they put in, if the money is in the budget, has to has to come from the commercial ask, then where else could it possibly come from? 
Yeah, so that was where we were talking about um, deltas from the budget. Um, so Medicare reimbursement is estimated to be a bit more favorable, um, but ba you know contingent on some important federal rules. Uh, there is a, a an additional GME payment that would also um, be able to uh, take uh, so which is half of about half of 21 point million, which I'll tell you more precisely soon. That would be able to take that off uh, the commercial rate, and so that just goes with the theory that um, UVM's policy is they they know the based on um, what they're expecting to happen, the amount of. Uh, revenue they'll need for that and they turn to the commercial uh, payers as a last resort for building that budget. <clears throat> Pam, if I can also clarify, I think the idea is the NPR would stay the same, NPR fixed perspective payment would stay the same, but where that revenue is coming from is changing due to new information about GME payments, about DISH payments, about potential increases in Medicare uh, reimbursements that were not anticipated at the time the budget was submitted. So it's where the money is coming from is has changing, but not the total revenue need. Does that make sense, Ham? Yes, thank you. That's all my question. Okay. Is there any other public comment at this time? Mike Fisher, I see your hand is raised. I think I can even lower it. Um, Thank you, uh, Chair Holmes, and um, thank you, uh, Board, and thank you, UVM Health Network. Uh, um, I want to just take a moment to recognize uh, the exchange of information, um, uh, UVM's answers to questions raised during the hearing. Um, was that last week? Um, and, and so uh, uh, a couple details I just think is worth saying out loud here. One of them is uh, just to recognize your answer about bad debt and free care between the hospitals uh, um, gave us some information that we didn't have uh, before. So that was useful and um, also recognition of some further work to do uh, on that. So I'm, I want to recognize that. I also want to recognize um, your answer about our our clinical race equity question. Um, it's uh, great to hear that uh, UVM is not doing a race correction uh, in spir spirometry. I don't know if I'm saying that right, spirometry, um, uh, as well as uh, your exploration of doing um, uh, in a pilot program of doing sickle cell trait um, testing. Um, a question for another day, uh, but I'll say it here. When we asked the question about spirometry to a non-UVM health network hospital, their answer was, wow, we really look to UVM for answers about how to uh, maneuver through things like this. And uh, we hope there's a process for sharing this kind of information to hospitals throughout Vermont. Uh, and then lastly, I, uh, I, we wanted to say out loud that um, we read UVM Health Network's response to our question about the RAND data, uh, spent some time considering the, uh, the complicated factors um, uh, that were raised, and, and we talked to RAND uh, about these moving pieces and how um, they impact the comparison of UVM to other academic uh, teaching hospitals. Um, and And just to make the statement that we at the HCA continue to be very concerned about the about how expensive UVM is in comparison to other hospitals. Thank you, Chair Holmes. Thank you, Mr. Fisher. Um, so I, I think at this point, first of all, I just want to thank Sarah and team for the analysis so far, and uh, it's very thorough and you know. It's, it gives us a really uh, unique way, and I think an important way to think about what's a very difficult decision ahead of us. Uh, I also want to recognize, take this time to recognize the incredible work that AHS did this summer to find funds to increase DISH to short-term stabilize the hospitals, find a way to increase potential GME payments to the medical center, uh, increasing some Medicaid rates, all with the goal of stabilizing the system and in so doing, reducing the pressure on commercial payers. So Secretary Samuelson and her team, I think deserve uh, great appreciation for those efforts and we're seeing them and the impact of them in this discussion right now. So I wanted to do a shout out to AHS and her team and their team over there at DIVA. 
And I think at this point, what I want to do is I want to take a recess until 1030. And that will give us some time just to process some of what we've heard. Uh, all of what we've heard, I think it's going to take also lunchtime to process uh, some of the more challenging hospitals that uh, where there's more analysis there. I would say that's CVMC and University of Vermont Medical Center. But let's take a recess until 1030. We'll come back in 1030 and we will start back at the beginning, which was uh, what was that what was after Grace? Is that Northeast? North we will start with NBRH. Yes. And then we will we will definitely take a recess for lunch as well. OK, so I'll see everybody back here at 1030. Thank you. OK, well, it's 1230. We are back. Welcome back. Hopefully the recess allowed everybody to not only digest their lunch, but also to digest these uh, these two budgets and the budget analysis by the staff. Admittedly, there's a lot there. It's pretty complicated. There's more nuance in the staff analysis in these two budgets than in the other ones. So what I thought we would do is start in the next hour or two uh, and just begin a conversation about these two budgets. Um, you know, we can talk about the overall NPR FPP requested rate and any proposed modifications to either the NPR FPP or the effective commercial rates. I just want to add that we don't need to vote today. If there is additional clarity or information that would help board members make a decision, we are not in a rush. We are back here on Wednesday, so it's more important that we get this right than that we do it quickly. So with that, why don't I turn it over? Uh, Sarah, you've pulled up CVMC's uh, options. Um, why don't we begin there and see if there's any questions, comments from the board, opportunities here? to consider some of these budget adjustments or not. Many board members have some thoughts here on CVMC. They've digested over lunch. Robin, I see you're unmuting um, yourself. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm happy to let somebody else go first, um, but could you go to slide 40, I think it's 43. Sarah. It looked like it went to slide 43. Oh, oh, oh sorry. It did. I'm just I tend to be a little bit delayed. Sorry about oh, that. No that was on. That was my Internet, not you. <laughs> um, so uh, could we just talk a little bit again about the Medicare rate changes? I know you said you didn't think it would have a significant impact, but um, I'm wondering I'm wondering if it's possible to get that information um, just so that we can consistently consider it. Absolutely. Obviously, that pushes us to next week um, mm -hmm. for a decision, but. Does anybody else have any questions or need for clarity? on where we stand here. I have a general question. Uh, just um, a couple of meetings ago, um, I raised the issue with Russ about um, when we can talk about the rate review, uh, QHP rate review decision in this process. And uh, I was told that the date was September 4th. So I'm just wondering, Will we have something from him? I think the fourth is what a Sunday, so next week. Um, uh, that allows us to uh, engage in the relationship between those between this process and the rate review process. That's a good question that I will ask. If Russ is on, do you have an answer to? Um, I I am on. I. Um, <clears throat> I, I, you're, you know you're, the sorry. you're breaking up russ i can't hear you sorry can you hear me all right yes okay um the rate review orders are uh of course public so um i don't know exactly um what the discussion you contemplate is, um, if it's 
you know, citing to something in those rate review orders, I, I think that's fine. Um, uh, I can, you know, defer to other legal colleagues too, if, if we'd like a, a little bit more clarity, I, um, but I don't know what, uh, if you'd, if there's something else you'd like. Um, no, so what I hear you saying is if it's something that was in the order and it is on our website, um, uh, then we, we, we could discuss it. <clears throat> I, yeah, I, I mean, if it's you want, if you want to state something in this proceeding that's stated in the order, I, I don't think that's an issue. Uh, I believe the request was not to get into discussions about the rate review process and deliberation um, for a few more days. So I, I don't know if that guidance is kind of helpful. I, I realize it's sort of general. Um, yeah, kind of leaves me in the middle of the road. <laughs> I feel like I'm going to get run over. If there's a fact that you want to bring up from the rate review publicly available. Well, well it's just, it's just in, as, as you know, Jess, there was, just, and I don't know if it is relevant. So someone could say that was that process and this is this process. But, you know, we did have a process in rate review where, where hospitals came in or the, uh, the uh, carriers were assuming that we were going to give hospitals 100% of what they asked. Um, and um, we engaged in that discussion and, and decided, well, that's not necessarily right, that we have a history here of approving budgets and our um, actuaries did a statistical analysis of that. And that came up with a certain percentage off the number um, uh, that totaled the all, all hospital request. And I'm just wondering, does that is that just in limbo now or of no consequence or is that percentage reduction something that um uh sarah's folks considered um i i just don't know where it stands but at the time it was it was a big conversation and very specific So we can move on. I'll go get I'll go get the uh, the actual wording from the order, and then uh, put that on the table. And uh, and you folks can tell me whether or not you think it's worth discussing or not. But I, I just don't want to leave it behind unattended. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Anybody else have a comment or a question? Something to raise about the CVMC budget? They need clarity on or an approach. I'd like to, um, I guess, gain some clarity about <clears throat> the decision point listed on this slide um, about the cost inflation from previous fiscal years. Um, that's not been included in previous hospital budget decisions. Um, do you mean, Sarah, that that's not been included in previous hospitals in this cycle? or? Ever. Yeah, I would say that uh, again, to our knowledge, there's not been like a term in a in a rate that breaks out inflationary increases uh, for the current versus upcoming fiscal year. It's not to say that it's not been in those rates. It's just never been presented to us this way. Um, and I think it's it's just uh, especially tricky given that no one predicted the expenses for fiscal year 22 and as we heard no one is sure uh how those are gonna play out in the short or long term i think we also have to acknowledge that um the health network hospitals came to us for a mid-year adjustment and you know we said to them we will deal with this in the budget process and so these expenses that were unbudgeted for which they requested a mid-year adjustment was kicked over into this process. 
So I think that may be why we're seeing it broken out this way for this year for this these hospitals. One, because of that process, but also two, because I think the magnitude of these unbudgeted expenses probably is larger than it has ever been seen before. So trying to break it out. That's what I'm guessing. Um, Tom, do you have some? Tom Walsh, did you have something else that you wanted to ask about? No, not to ask about. Um, or to comment on. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. My, as as I've said uh, previously, my concern is that uh, Vermonters have been facing uh, steeper inflationary increases over a longer period of time than our healthcare delivery systems have in the last year and a half. And, and I think the, the approach to the, the socially responsible approach to dealing with inflation is probably not to inflate prices further. So I'm struggling with how to, how to deal with that. Um, I don't have a specific question about it. Um, I'm hoping to uh, listen more to my colleagues, um, but I'm, I'm struggling with that. Well, I think to be fair, I think we're all struggling with this. Um, I think that's why we're, you know, we parked this discussion to the afternoon and while we may not come to an agreement today about what to do about this, um, it's, it, these are, these are, very significant increases in in effective rate and um, unprecedented. We use that word a lot, but that's the year that we're in. Uh, I have some thoughts. I'll share them um, if it helps maybe move the conversation forward a little bit. Um, when I let's just talk about you know CVMC's NPR and FPP growth for a second. Uh, it's most of it is driven by rate. Um, in fact, on a budget to budget basis, utilization is expected to decline on a projected to budget basis. Utilization is expected to rise two uh, percent, I think, if, if my numbers are right here. So for me, on the utilization front, given the wait times, given the access issues at the network right now and the hopes for greater network integration um, in fiscal year 23, with perhaps some care that's maybe being backlogged up at EVM, shifting back down to CVMC. My, I, I'm comfortable with the CVMC utilization aspect of the NPR FPP request. If we turn to the rate, which is driving a lot of the increase, um, you know, obviously that's where there's a far more complicated decision to be made, in my mind anyway. So I'm gonna throw out a possibility for us to consider, uh, which would, uh, uh, I think, apply to both CVMC and UVMMC in terms of the methodology that I'm going to propose. And this is that we approve an allowable range for the effective commercial rate. We don't set one number, we set an allowable range, a range that provides both a not to exceed ceiling and a minimum floor. This would allow for some healthy negotiation between hospitals and the payers, something that the payers have told us is limited because the, the Green Mountain Care Board sets rates and then those are believed to be set in stone. So that range would allow some of that market negotiation to occur. It also would allow some time for clarity on the Medicare you know, OPPS rule. So in thinking about what that range might be and how I might approach it, um, again, this is another something to consider, but for both hospitals, you could take, uh, you could set the maximum allowable commercial rate in the following way. This is the maximum, right? So this is just the top end. You might take the effective commercial rate that was submitted, okay? Reduce it by the fiscal year 22 dish amount, right? So which that would reduce the you know, CVMC's effective commercial rate by I think 1.59 and it would reduce UVM's by 1.55, right? That would be just taking off the fiscal year 22 dish amount that's now materialized. Next, you could remove the lower end of the uh, Medicare IPPS estimated rate effect 
We don't have that yet for CVMC. We do have it for UVM. It's minus 0.35. And then for UVM, you could additionally reduce uh, the amount by the new GME that's likely to be approved by the legislature. If it's not approved, I would just say I think um, UVM would have every right to return to the board for adjustment. So, um, you know, that would be how you might take for both hospitals. And I'm saying both hospitals now so you can understand my methodology or my thought process here. That taken together, that gets you to a maximum rate. Um, then to get to the minimum rate, right, the floor, you again could start with the effective commercial rate that was submitted. In this case, you could remove, if, if so inclined, unbudgeted expense carryover. Tom, I know that's a concern for you. And remove both the expected IPPS and OPPS, uh, perhaps even at the higher range of the estimates, and also make the adjustment for GME. That gets you to the lower bound, right? So now you have an upper bound and a lower bound. And then effectively, we let market forces and heated negotiations between the payers and the hospital come to bear, right? I think there is some justification for carryover of some of the unbudgeted expenses from fiscal year 22, largely because they came in for a mid-year rate increase and we told them to wait. And some of these expenses are going to carry over into fiscal year 23. So they are going to be there. Uh, I believe there was some testimony, and we can check this, that at least some of that carryover may be related to traveler expenses. So, you know, there that may be something we can revisit or we can ask for further clarification on. I would also say I think the reason to have the upper bound and the lower bound is there may be some relief in sight for some of the for these two hospitals. Um, to the degree that the state is infusing dollars into the system to reduce workforce pressures, that may have some impact. One of the expense drivers was uh, system flow and backlog of mental health patients and patients who needed post-acute care. You know, starting July 1st, only recently Medicaid started began you know offering per diem reimbursements um, to you know for Medicaid patients in the ED that are awaiting mental health placement. That is going to hopefully help going forward. There's also some efforts underway to mitigate some of the bottlenecks in long-term care and residential care facilities that may come through workforce incentives. It may come through potentially higher Medicaid reimbursements. There's some uncertainty there. Uh, but if the capacity is increased in these post-acute settings, it may mitigate some of the cost pressures in these two hospitals. So there's hope there. There's also in my mind, and these are some of my questions, that there may be some relief in sight on the capacity constraint with Dartmouth-Hitchcock coming on board. Um, potentially that may reduce some of the pressures. Don't know, these are all unknowns. Uh, and there's also some potential upside potential with 340B, right? If to the degree that some of that revenue is recaptured by the Supreme Court decision. Again, these are all areas that are up in the air. So to, in my mind, I think if we were able to, and I, you know, I threw out some possible ways to come up with a min and a max, but if we came up with a min and a max um, for these hospitals, and again, I'll say for me, CVMC's NPR is reasonable based on the utilization. And I would say the same thing about UVM. I think that their increase in utilization, I hope they get it because it means some of the wait times and the access issues will be mitigated. So to the degree that that utilization goes up, I think that means patients will get the care that they need in our in these hospitals. Uh, it's just a question of where the dollars come from, right? And whether they're coming from Medicare increases in rates, whether they're coming from GME, whether they're coming from DISH. So I, to me, setting up potentially setting up a range, allowing some market negotiation within that range, but coming up with a min and a max that we think is reasonable. Um, might be a way to go forward. So I'll throw that out there as an idea. We can talk about it with respect to CVMC first or the, the principle in general. Uh, <clears throat> I appreciate the principle uh, quite a bit and I'm also uh, relieved to hear of the potential uh, statewide support to address the log jam issue. Um, altering altered budgets in any one facility uh, won't fix the log jam. 
right? And and so that requires a real systematic look at things. So I'm really pleased to hear about that. Um, the the min and the max and the negotiation um, possibilities. I'm also very in favor of of competition and uh, negotiation that way. I do wonder how much um, leverage a payer has negotiating with a hospital in Vermont. Um, there's just not a lot of competition among uh, the hospitals. So I don't know how much leverage there is there. So I think the range that you're describing, I think I followed how you're setting the min and the max. It'd be nice to see it written out. Um, but that's an idea that I I tend to favor with with some uh, with the concerns that I just mentioned. Any other? Okay. Oh, yeah, Robin. Yeah. Um, I like I like the concept. Um, I think it is. I think it's helpful um, to try and think about how to address so many unknowns. Um, on the fiscal year 22 cost inflation, I think the tough part for me with that is that it's, you know, really, I think of it a little bit differently in the sense of, I think of what happened in fiscal year 22 is expenses were higher than budgeted, understandably due to the unexpected inflationary pressures and workforce issues and COVID issues. Um, most of or many of those expenses didn't go away between now and are not expected to go away into 23. That means it's built into the, but the way I think about that would be it's built into the base. And so um, really like the breaking it out is just a way to show what hit when more than, you know, thinking of it as like, I don't really thinking, think it, of it so much as carrying forward 22 expenses, but that ex expenses that started in 22, like wage increases don't magically go away in 23. Um, but I also, you know, I think, the hospital, both hospitals did have some efforts that they included in their budget in terms of cost savings, because of course there are, there's three different components in any budget. There's the utilization, there's the rate, and then there's expense reduction. And so I think having, um, you know, I, I think keeping the NPR where it is in both cases makes sense to me because that leaves all three options available um, should throughput get better than expected, or should uh, there be additional cost savings that come to light, or should you know the exp the assumptions around inflation be different than what we're built in? So, all of that's kind of a long-winded way of saying um, I I agree. I think I would leave the NPR where at the request for both hospitals and. Um, I am on board with the idea of creating a range. Any other comments or thoughts at this time? Or anything, information, if there is appetite for a range, any information that you need that you don't have to set what those range mins and max should be? Um, the two things, sorry, Tom, Pelham, I think you might have been about to jump in, but the two things um, I was interested in are the Medicare impacts for CVMC and um, I know Sarah's said she would check in with UVM about the GME um, because that is, I mean, my re recollection, Medicaid, being involved with Medicaid budget was a long time at, at this point for me, but uh, we do fund the state share to draw down the federal match with in-kind from UVM. So 
that does mean that there is a match rate assumed and it looks like Sarah's already adjusted it. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. Thank you to her right, now. Uh, get that right. Uh, so it is, and thanks to UVM for their very quick response. But it's 11.9 net after we account for the expense. Um, I also had uh, um, I had uh, some few mismatched denominators here. So these are the updated uh, factors for everyone for UVM MC. Tom Pelham, did you? Or sorry, Robin, did you? Were you going to say something else? No, I was just going to say thanks. Tom Pelham, did you have a comment? Um, yeah, I like the idea of a range. I mean, there's so much, uh, not volatility, but so much uh, uncertainty, both of, in the times, in the context of society, and and uh, um, the, the pandemic and things of that sort, that a range makes sense. Um, the, uh, actually, I was thinking that uh, the language in the board order having to do with rate review kind of dealt with that issue. Um, I, and Russ can pull that language up. I've been emailing back and forth here. Um, he can uh, pull that language up so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, um, yeah, I can share it. Just give me one minute. But I also you know, agree with Robin. I think I agree with Robin in that. Uh, people, when hospitals are putting together their budgets, they're putting together what they think they need in 2003, um, and you know didn't kind of carve out, didn't kind of carve out the um, uh, 2022 inflation. Um, I assume whatever of that was going to carry forward from 2022 to 2023, they built that in their budget to cover it. Um, so. So here's that language. Um, it's the third paragraph down here, and I'll just read it because uh, I don't know if it makes sense to be part of this discussion or part of a range or, but it says, because we, we're at the board, we're trying to get to uh, what to use um, in our deliberations there relative to a, um, uh, to hospitals um, because uh, we were told that the hospitals were basically um, or that the carriers were basically using what the uh, hospitals asked for dollar for dollar. Um, and uh, so there was a discussion and we went to our actuary to say, what do you think basically? And they said a reasonable approach this year is to assume the board will reduce hospitals proposed rates by the average percentage rate reduction that the board has imposed over the past five years, which is we calculate as approximately 17%. We think this is a reasonable approach because reductions in recent years have tended to be larger for larger budget requests, and this year's requests are historically high. Furthermore, this year's historically high requests reflect budgeted revenue growth for many hospitals that exceeds the two-year revenue guidance set by the set by the board. So, you know, do we have a mismatch here? Um, do do we have carriers that uh, you know where where we approved rates for carriers based on a 17 percent, 12 percent, 15 percent, 2 percent, whatever reduction um, in uh, from what the hospitals ask? I don't know. Um, I, I don't know how this fits in, um, but that's and, and so I'm not asking this with a point. I just don't know how it fits because it's a real number that we used um, in another process, and that number got embedded in that pro in the results of that process. Yeah, I think the point that I would make there, Tom, is that that process was our best guess at the time based on her historical experience with uh, reductions in hospital budgets. Now we have the full information of the hospital budgets before us. We have that information. I would not want to be wed to the decision we made without full information. So I think it's yep. important to check and see and, and use that as a guiding post going forward. But we have full information now about each of these hospitals. We've had hearings. We have to make our decisions about these hospital budgets based on the information that we have in front of us now. That's that's my answer to that. I, I, I fully agree with that, Jess. It's uh, we are where we are now. We are farther down the road. We know more. But um, those hospital budgets that were first submitted to us 
were available at you know prior to 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 this decision being made. So it, it wasn't that the actuary was guessing; they could actually go to the adaptive, you know, same documents that we go to 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 uh, to to see what hospitals were asking for. Understand. So that's what went. So I, 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 I raise this. I support your range approach. I think that makes sense, um, and I think it it deals directly with the conversations we had about who negotiates with who and how much, um, and that's kind of what this was trying to get at too. Is it's 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 not it's not the Green Mountain Care Board that's in the final analysis setting the rate. There is a negotiation process between the payer and so there you go. Thank you, Tom. Now, now Michael's going to blow his whistle. I think there's one piece of information that it would be helpful for me to have. I know Robin already mentioned the Medicare uh, inpatient and outpatient estimated bump for CVMC. Understanding that would be helpful. I think that perhaps um, from the health network, it would be helpful to get some clarification on uh, or confirmation maybe it's just confirmation that the fiscal year 22 unbudgeted expense growth that we're seeing in the rates is truly uh, a carry forward and and believed to be permanent if these are wage increases that are now contracted going forward tell us that so maybe a little bit of a, a breakdown on the fiscal year 22 my term unbudgeted expense growth their term cost inflation um, and I think that might help us as well. I, I do agree that if if it's these are, you know, if this is the way they're breaking it out and this is expense growth that is permanent, um, then we should understand that. So does that make sense, Sarah, to, to request? Yes, uh, I will add that to the punch list here. <clears throat> um, and I just I just the way I interpret the the wording in that that order, I think it's an, an observation about past board behavior. Um, so it's a measurement of what has happened. Um, just it's, so that's why it's like a finding. I wouldn't say it was like the assumption or recommendation uh, that was in the rate. So I just want to be clear for the record. Thank you, Sarah. That's helpful. Is there anything else that uh, I'm, I'm trying to Set, get a sense from the board if there's any other information that we need or there's any other approaches that we might consider that we have yet, not yet talked about with either one of these budgets. Well, maybe, I mean, so I, I have a uh, long-standing concern um, uh, with the UVM budget. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I don't have a, you know, and I, I've said in my dissenting opinions in the past on the UVM budget, I don't, I don't blame, you know, I'm not trying to cast blame or accuse UVM. They're just taking advantage uh, of the opportunities that are given them. And so the, the, the thing that disturbed me in the 20 and 21 budget process not in 22 because of COVID and all the federal money was around, but in the 2021 process was the case mix issue, which isn't front and center this year in this process, but in the past, you know, the the, the case mix um, at the hospital levels were, were there. And I, I kind of view it as kind of the equalization issues that Vermont went through in terms of property tax and access to equal educational opportunity, you know, um, at the town level. So some you had the stove versus the standards, and we have evolved ourselves uh, today to a um, a point where there is much more equal access to educational opportunity. And so, you know, here, you know, where, and I don't know what the case mix mixes are now. I haven't seen the data, but last year you'd have like a 10% case mix uh, for Medicaid in um, uh, in UVM's area and a 17. 18% down in Springfield. And so, so um, is there a case mix there? So the top of those gross revenue bars are what is coming in through net patient revenue just based on charge. So uh, it, it doesn't have that fixed perspective payment, which um, is taking right. more off of this chart for Medicaid than right. other payers. 
uh, proportionally, <laughs> but also a bunch of Medicare is also kind of off the yeah. chart. So, I mean, so even here that doesn't have FPP in it, you can see, you know, for commercial um, um, UVM medical at 67 percent, Medicare 17 percent and Medicaid 10 percent. Those to me aren't unfamiliar numbers. And, um, you know, so I, I just think the playing field is not level. And um, so it's a concern of mine. I've tried to deal with it twice before and um, uh, have been unsuccessful. Um, for this year, I'll just give you some quick numbers. Um, the total amount that hospitals are asking for for 2023 above their 2022 budget is $302 million. And UVM Medical Center um, owns 150 of that. So they're at 49.6%. So as you kind of walk uh, forward, um, and you know, this is using the information that hospitals submitted to you know for the budget. You can see that of that 302.6 million, 236.6 million of it, or 78%, is commercial. Um, and then you can and and that is a 14.6% increase over the year before, which clearly is uh, the concern in part that that ratepayers are raising. Then of that 236.6 million increase, UVM um, has asked for 152.9 million of it, or 64.6%. Um, and that that is to me a problem of the case mix. You know, UVM can ask for it because they can get it. Um, and again, it's I'm not blaming them or assigning fault. It's just the way it is. Um, so I, I think that we live in, um, you know, uh, uh, in, in, you know that, that, that we're dealing with a process where the playing field is not level. Um, and I don't know what to do about it. I don't want, I, so I've, I've told both Sarah and Jess, I don't want to go in cutting budgets this year. I mean, people are, people are just, you know, hospitals are trying to dig themselves out of a hole. And I think uh, the analogy I used is we've got to send the fire trucks to the fire. I mean, and that's what our, our our job is this year. But at the same time, going forward, at some point, this crisis is going to be over, and that case mix issue is still going to be there, uh, um, hindering uh, some schools. So that's my two cents. Thank you, Tom. Any other board comments, questions, need for clarity? Maybe at this point, then, that I will open it up for public comment. Mr. Gobey, I see your hand raised. You're on mute, though. Chair Holmes, thank you. Uh, thank you to the members of the board. I just wanted to run down uh, through a list of some of the things that I heard mentioned and uh, clarify or comment uh, on some of the conversation. So so first of all, That's Medicare good. assumptions for CVMC, we can get those to you. Um, that's not that's not a problem. Um, the second on the qualified health plan rate review process. Um, I just want to say that I, 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 I grow very concerned when anyone handicaps a board's um, sort of like cutting because that would mean that we take that into account or into effect when we produce our budgets so if we always knew you were going to cut by 17 percent you know we would learn quickly to always increase our budgets by 17 percent saying we get what we needed and i, I just want to say that dr brumstead has been very clear and that rick and i have been been clear while under oath with you that our budgets are exactly what we need we don't take any of that into account or, or into effect in the calculations of, of what we need. So I just want to call that out. I understand what member Pelham was saying, and that's a different conversation than what I'm bringing up, but I just want to point out how we view it as those submitting budgets. Third, the cost inflation that we talk about in FY22 is 100% in FY23. That, that, is, that is a linear move. 
Now, we have talked as a team here, all of us, what's going to happen with inflation. And if it does go down or, you know, turns really down as the Federal Reserve and all of us are hoping, our budget next year will reflect that those changes. But right now, we've gone through a, a period of hyperinflation, you know, the highest inflation folks have seen in 40 years. And that is what is projected on our FY23 budget. And for the record, I want to give an example of what we're talking about. We all know that labor is our largest expense. We also know that labor is driving the, our costs, and it is something that is a national marketplace and a national workforce crisis that we cannot adjust on our own. So in FY22, I look at Dr. Leffler, and I remember the conversations we had as we negotiated with the union, and we gave uh, uh, an, an increase in FY22 of 10%. So if you were making $38 an hour as a nurse, you got 10% in FY22. That was not in our in our rates and went right to a negative impact on our bottom line. And it did not go away. That 10% increase that brought them to $41 an hour roughly, just doing some quick math here, um, we then have an increase of 5% projected for October 1st as part of our collective bargaining agreement. They will then go up in FY23. It is, as member Lunge um, artfully uh, described, it is baked into the base. And so when we talked about our cost inflation, we said this amount is baked into the base. We're moving it into 23. But I also want to say that we took $50 million off and put that on ourselves to reduce our costs. And we did deduct that from the conversation that we had in the mid-year. So every single hospital budget that you've looked at did the same thing we did. They just didn't separate it. I can tell you that Claudio Fort gave a 10% increase in FY22 and his union negotiation with his nurses. It impacted us. He went first. It is most certainly in his FY23 rates. And 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 so that so so that calls into question the point of and it's something that I would respectfully ask the board. Please treat the hospitals equally and the same in this process. We called it out because you asked us to in the FY22 mid-year to, to bring it forward, which we did. We've never called it out before because it's always a part of the calculation of a, of a budget. Next, the range. We'd like time to think about what we heard today. We don't have a comment on that yet. Let us let us think about it. And I also would agree with member Walsh. It'd be good to see it written down. I was trying to keep up uh, uh, Chair Holmes, but I'm not so sure I, I did a good job of being a student here today, but um, we'll come back to that. But I would call out to the board that in the opening of this PowerPoint, there's the components of what have to go into a hospital budget order. And there's one particularly labeled E that calls out that we're supposed to come back and tell you of material changes to our budget. And so as that happens, you know, that is that is a process that that should be ongoing. But these changes have never been this size before. That's why we came to you calling out, hey, we want to wait till November 15th and reconcile these things so that we don't raise commercial rates any higher than we need to, because we feel the same way as you do. They shouldn't go any higher than they absolutely need to. But I, but I would worry that, um, that we construct any system that is just really hard for us to operationalize. But I wanna keep, I wanna keep that set aside. The next point, the member Pelham's good point about what we call payer mix. Payer mix is very important in what we do. It does impact the hospitals. If you have a, a strong government payer mix, things can be hard financially, but there are all sorts of um, programs with the federal government. There are critical access hospital, Medicare, Medicare dependent hospital, sole community provider, 
that provide ways to to sort of offset some of that that you have to take into account when you look at payer mix. But that's not my real point under payer mix. My real point is it's primarily driven by demographics. And so it's not, it can't be moved around like the money in an educational system. The patients live in a place and typically get their care there, especially for things like primary care. The, the next point I wanna make about payer mix is for dialysis in the state of Vermont, the payer mix is irrelevant because the only one that provides it is the University of Vermont Medical Center. So, so 100% of that program is done by the Academic Medical Center. So if it's done in Rutland, it's done by Dr. Leffler's team. If it's done at North Country, it's Dr. Leffler's team. If it's done at CVMC, our own family, that's Dr. Leffler's team. That's the way it works in the state. So we do things that no one else does in the state. The NICU would be another good example. And so um, the last thing I wanna talk about is um, the, the overall process, you know, just calling this out. We came forward with a more in-depth um, reach out in partnership with you to say, let's not raise commercial rates more than we need to, but that we needed our budget approved as submitted. We stand firm with that. And we would ask that you do not treat us differently than other hospitals in the way that you regulate, because regulation cannot be done that way. We can't be, we can't be different than what we are today because we wish inflation or costs were lower. We can't, we just can't make that happen. And thank you for your time, Chair Holmes. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. You're welcome. Thank you for your comment. Any other public comment at this time? Mr. Fisher. I don't see my camera, so. Do you see my camera? Yes. OK, um, um, I think I want to make this as a process comment more than a comment about the individual hospitals being considered here. Um, I, I'm not going to express an opposition to the concept of a range um, because I think I understand that you need a way to approach this. Um, but I do want to make a express a, a concern or maybe a prediction that the uh, that the outcome at the end of the day will be at or very close to the top of the range. That's my concern as a as a as a guy who's got to come here with a uh, um, speaking particularly to the concern about consumer affordability. Um, so maybe I'm wrong, but that's my prediction. And uh, and given that, uh, I guess I want to make the the humble request that as board members consider if the board does pursue a range and as board members consider the factors of that range that you feel comfortable with the top of the range. Thank you, Chair Holmes. Thank you for that comment. Any other public comment at this time? Okay, I'm not seeing any now, any more public comment. I would like to turn it back to the board and just see if if there's any additional thoughts you have on anything you've just heard. Any more information that you might need or any anything that you would like to ask Sarah Lindbergh and her team to do before next Wednesday? No, I'm and, seeing <clears throat> just uh, to make sure that I haven't neglected anything, uh, I will follow up about um, kind of how the Inflation for fiscal year 22, it um, flows through in the fiscal year uh, 23 additional uh, inflation, just so we have a sense of kind of those moving parts, um, a little more detail, and then getting estimates for those um, <clears throat> now final IPS um, and potential project projections for the OPS uh, Medicare reimbursement changes by hospital, um, specifically for CVMC and UVM. MC, uh, were there any other uh, follow-ups I missed? 
I don't I don't think so. Okay. Does anybody else have anything else for follow up? Not so not so much um, new work or anything that would require more investigation, but just um, a good display of the calculation to get to the lower and upper bounds. Yeah, and I think I would say, Sarah, uh, for me, the lower bound, um, you know, one of my concerns was just what of the uh, cost inflation expense growth from 22 is being carried over that's not permanent. If it's all permanent, as Mr. Gobey just said, I would, for me personally, I would not use that full cut then to get to the minimum, right? So, so I just want to make clear that, um, you know, part of me was not fully understanding that it was 100% permanent baked into the base for fiscal year 23. If it in fact is, I, I, my minimum would not include a full reduction um, for what they've counted in fiscal year 22 cost inflation. If that makes sense to you, Sarah. Picking it up, thanks. Picking me up, picking it up. So <laughs> I think that's important to, to really get, sounds like mm -hmm. we've got that from Mr. Gobey's testimony here today, but just as you're following up on that, that would be helpful. Anything else from anybody? So uh, one quick one, um, and maybe I missed it, is what is going, how is UVM going to apply this new GME and this new uh, dish money relative to this process? Is it, is it going to go into substitute as revenue um, for their, their proposed budget? Yeah, and so therefore just, there therefore are, there, there's a rate reduction associated with that. That's right. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, that's the math we'll do a better job of kind of showing in in the um kind of overall. But the revenue, the NPR request and the FPP request would stay the same. Correct. Um, yeah. 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 It's just, just where that it, revenue get is. Get it from a different bucket. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. And if if I could just um follow up with a question I, I think for 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 you Jess if I'm understanding what you were saying a moment ago if the if we're able to tease out what part of the what I would call the carryover for lack of a more appropriate term just yet but if um, let's say that that was ten ten dollars and eight of those dollars were somehow were able to deem that they're permanent that they, they will be baked into the base going forward, then the reduction that we would be considering would be the remaining $2. Yes, although I think what we just heard from Mr. Gobey was that the $10 is fully being carried over into fiscal year 23, so there is no $2. I, but I, understand, I understand, and I, 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 um, I'm not sure how we'll get it get it at that number that's where i'm I'm looking for sarah for some help because um no one is expecting the same traveler expenses for example in 23 and and that's just an example that there are inflate there have been inflationary pressures they're expected to ease the economists that reported to us said that there is sometimes a lag that the healthcare sector may not have experienced its worst inflation yet. So I'm trying to keep all that in mind, but the the inflationary pressure that was felt in 2022 is not expected to remain the same going forward. It may increase, but there are some indicators that it should decline. So I, I worry about baking it into the base, particularly with um, negotiations coming forward down the road. I just, I want to see how yeah. we tease that out and and how the, how our staff can help us tease that out and then adjust and I, the bottom of the range accordingly. Yeah, I think that Sarah, what Sarah will have to do is work with UVM. I think that what I'm hearing, but again, I think this is what we need confirmation of, is that these are contracted negotiations, largely for labor, that were made in 2022. The example that Mr. Gobey gave of the $38 you know, uh, nurses' salary that uh, increased from 30, I can't remember all the numbers that, that Al gave, but basically, right, there was a 10% bump and then there's going to be a 5% bump on top. That 10% bump 
right, is in there indefinitely because that was a contract that was negotiated above and beyond what they anticipated when they made that budget. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, there is additional expected increases in salaries as part of those negotiations that are going to materialize in fiscal year 23. So I think as long as the, the health network can um, quantify that and show us, so to speak, the Sarah Lindbergh word of receipts for how that, you know, those are indeed permanent and they're baked into contracts that are going to be ongoing. I think we're, uh, that's the data that we need. And, and then I, I suspect there's going to be, if the board is open to ranges, there's probably, you know, Air, uh, ranges around the estimates in the budget that we might be able to accommodate in this exercise to um, help get at some, some of that uncertainty because uh, plenty of that to go around. <clears throat> okay. Well, with that, um, I think that we've exhausted probably all that we can do for the day, uh, unless there's anybody else from the board has any other additional comments or questions. No. Okay, well, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. So moved. Okay, I'll take Robin as the motion to adjourn and Tom Pelham as the second. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nope. So the motion passes unanimously. We have an afternoon to to think about all of this and come back next Wednesday. So we will resume next Wednesday at noon. We'll resume with our conversation around UVM and CVMC, and then we'll hopefully tackle as well Brattleboro, Springfield, and North Country. And I guess I would ask Sarah and team, you know, if these are also as complicated and difficult, if there's, you know, uh, the lessons that we're thinking about for UVM and CVMC, if this methodology applies to those budgets that also exceeded the 8.6 if they could be applied as a as a possible option for us to consider that would be great haven't thought that far ahead myself but you know as yeah you're doing it, yeah it's like it's applicable as, as applicable yeah exactly <laughs> sounds good <laughs> yeah. all right thank you sarah